I, 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 I am not of the belief, and I know this might disturb some of you, but I am not of the belief of an imminent rapture. I am in a belief of a God that has a calendar system, and he's doing things on the calendar. And he is a God of order, and he's not going to come whenever. This does not mean the rapture is going to happen between here and here. Why? Because the rapture could happen before we get out of this building. This does say you're running out of time. And he's not going to come whenever. You have lost that moral impact. That's, that purifies our lives, John says in 1 John chapter 3. If we have this hope, it purifies our lives. People say, oh, there's an escape fear, and you're selling your hands and sitting around waiting for Jesus to come. No, if you expect him to come in any moment, you are going to be living for him, witnessing for him, working for him. You don't have seven years of great tribulation to, to do this. You don't have any time. You don't know when he might come. We better shape up right now and live for him. And a post anything does not have that powerful moral impact. I believe that the fullness of the Gentiles will be fulfilled perfectly in conjunction with his calendar. So, uh, and it is what it is. It's just an opinion. It's just my opinion. It's based on my research, and I could be wrong. But I am not of the belief of an imminent rapture, and he's not going to come whenever. No, if you expect him to come in any moment, you are going to be living for him, witnessing for him, working for him. You don't have seven years of great tribulation to, to do this. You don't have any time. You don't know when he might come. We better shape up right now and live for him. And a post anything does not have that powerful moral impact. It's just my opinion. It's based on my research, and I could be wrong. I'm going to come to a very interesting and timely topic right now, and that's the one about prophecy. Uh, Dave Hunt, let me come to you to start with. Do you think, first of all, that the topic of prophecy is important? Should Christians bother, first of all, to look at it and to read it and to try and figure it out? And then secondly, let me ask you this the, the, right off the top of my head. Is it possible that Christ could come back even right now? Well, I, if we're going to take what, how God views prophecy, he devoted about 25% of the Bible to it. So I think that in itself says it's pretty important. Jesus talked about it. He talked about the last days. He gave signs. He said he was coming again. Uh, and he warned us to be ready. And in fact, he said, at such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. Uh, the signs that are given, in my opinion, and we might have some differences and probably don't have time to straighten all those out among the panelists here, but in my opinion, uh, we have to distinguish between Israel and the church. Uh, Christ is coming for his bride, to take his bride to heaven, for the saints, and he is coming with his saints at the second coming to rescue Israel and Armageddon. I don't believe that in the Bible there are any signs for the rapture. There are signs about the second coming. So the rapture could take place at any time. In fact, the Christians ought to be expecting him to come at any time, and the early Christians did. For example, 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 1, verse 10, Paul says, I know that you're Christians. We've already had it quoted because you turn to God from idols to serve the living and the true God, and what? And to wait for his son from heaven. You don't go down to the airport and wait for Aunt Jane if she wrote to you and saying she's coming six months from now. You would only go and wait for somebody if you expected them right at that moment. Uh, uh, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27 says, and un well, let's take the whole thing because we've been talking about it. As it is appointed on a man once to die, no reincarnation, and after this the judgment. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him, Shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation? Now, I don't believe that that means a partial rapture. Only those who happen to be looking in the sky when Jesus returns are going to be taken. But I believe that it means it is characteristic of Christians to be anticipating, expecting, longing, and looking for our Savior. Because uh, Philippians chapter 3 verse 20 says that our citizenship, our conversation, our way of life is in heaven 
from whence also we look for our Savior, the Lord Jesus, who will change his vile body and so forth. So, yes, he could come at any time. And I think, it, uh, John, it really is important because uh, it's intended to have the, the, the hope of the imminent return. It's intended to have a powerful moral impact on our lives. It's very significant that Jesus likened a thought that he would delay his coming to evil. He said, what and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, my Lord delayeth his coming? A post, you know, I don't want to upset my, some of my brothers who may disagree with me, but I would say not just a post-treb or a post-millennial, a post-anything. If anything stands between you and the return of Christ, you have lost that moral impact that's, that purifies our lives, John says in 1 John chapter 3. If we have this hope, it purifies our lives. People say, oh, there's an escape fear, and you're selling your hands and sitting around waiting for Jesus to come. No, if you expect him to come in any moment, you are going to be living for him, witnessing for him, working for him. You don't have seven years of great tribulation to, to do this. You don't have any time. You don't know when he might come. We better shape up right now and live for him. And a post anything does not have that powerful moral impact. The Old Testament prophets clearly state that when the Jewish people return from their second exile in 1948, they will never be removed from the land again. I'm simply saying, the Iranians, the Russians, the Arab uprising, it's not going to remove Israel. God Almighty is going to defend Israel himself. In 1967, Israel was attacked by six Arab armies, committed to driving them into the sea. Tears. They were attacked on Yom Kippur. The Six-Day War was a war of miracles. John Hagee Ministries telecast a TV series called Against All Odds, showing the miracles of God in giving Israel victory after victory for which there was no military reason. That brought the unification of Jerusalem. For the first time in 2,000 years, the Jewish people were praying at the Western Wall. The Bible says in St. Luke, when Jerusalem is no longer trodden down by the Gentiles, meaning it's under the control of the Jewish people, then shall the end come. God lit up the heavens with four blood moons. I don't remember anyone reporting it. What does this mean? Listen closely. This does not mean the rapture is going to happen between here and here. Why? Because the rapture could happen before we get out of this building. This does say you're running out of time. We talked about the Jewish wedding, the ketubah, the betrothal, payment of the purchase price, the bride set apart, the bridegroom departs to his father's house, prepares the room addition, and the bride then prepares for his return, which is imminent, could happen any time. And this leads to a very fundamental teaching in the New Testament, we call the doctrine of imminence. And uh, what it simply means is that there's nothing that need precede it. Doesn't mean it'll happen tomorrow, but it could happen tomorrow or next week or anything. It, there's no precedent requirement. If it's imminent, it means it could be right now. The word imminent, it's the next expectation. The next event in God's program is for the bride to be gathered by the bridegroom. There are all kinds of other things that'll happen subsequently, but that's the next thing to happen. A, a next expectation, there's no precedent condition. Now don't confuse this with eminent, it's spelled with an A, eminent, that, uh, that's, that, me, that, that means that God is not only transcendent or far above us, but he's always with us and active on our behalf. So that term in theology has another meaning, a different spelling. Nor should it be confused with eminent, which is a title of honor reserved with persons of outstanding distinction. So there's three different words that get confused, eminent with an I, I-M-M-I-N-A-T, meaning next expectation, nothing, nothing, nothing need precede it. Believers are taught to expect the Savior from heaven at any moment. That's all through the New Testament. Philippians 3.20, Titus 2.13, Hebrews 9.28, 1 Thessalonians 1, 4, 5, Revelation 22, and so on. Clearly, you cannot get through the New Testament without a consciousness that the believers were to conduct their lives in a moment-by-moment -moment expectancy of the return of the Savior. That whole concept is eminency. 
If you understand that, that, that concept, you'll discover many theories that are floating around the landscape would violate that. If there are precedent conditions, then, uh, uh, then that, that punctures the doctrine of eminency. And the, the First Thessalonians 1.10 is the best example. It expresses the hope and warmth of, of expectancy. And it should result in a victorious and purified life. People who are living with that expectancy are minding their knitting. They're, 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 uh, they're, they're living their lives in a literal expectation that the Lord could come at any moment. The minute you start letting go of that is when you, you'll find you start slipping. It's a very, very purifying doctrine. Now, by the way, Paul did seem to include himself among those who look for Christ's return. We saw that in 1 Thessalonians 4 and 2 Thessalonians 2, also the uh, 2 Thessalonians 5 we just looked at. Timothy was admonished by Paul to keep his, this commandment without spot or rebuke until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, the Jewish converts were reminded that yet a little while and he that shall come will come and he will not tarry, Hebrews 10. There are many of these. In fact, the Lord's instruction on the other side is to occupy till I come. And uh, see, the expectation of some were so strong that they'd stop work. You know, the Lord's, the Lord's coming next Tuesday, let's relax. And uh, so they had to be exhorted to return to their jobs in 2 Thessalonians 3. And to have patience, James 5.8. In other words, there was such an expectation, they were sort of overreacting to that and uh, putting their feet on the desk, you know. And that's tragic because that's also a legitimate criticism of people who embrace the doctrine I'm talking about, the, the pre-trib rapture. Some of the people who don't hold that view can be critical of us because they, that uh, there's a tendency of, of us not to roll up our sleeves and recognize there's things that need to be done in the meantime. So there's two extreme problems. One problem is the rap, what I call rapturitis, rapture paralysis, you might call it. And the other one is the rapture mania, the date setters. And uh, both, those are both extremes at the opposite ends. Rapturitis. That's a uniquely American dementia, I believe. When I travel abroad, I don't f find as much as here. But here in America, it's amazing how many people who believe in the rapture, pre-trib rapture, just because the church, I think you can show from the scripture, and we'll get into that in the next session, will not go through the Great Tribulation. Why should we escape what most of the body of Christ in most of the world for most of the past 2,000 years has had to endure? It's called persecution. Church was promised persecution. And, uh, and you can call that persecution tribulation. It's troubled times. It's not the great tribulation as definitively, definitively described. It's tribulation that comes from where? Where does the church get persecuted? From the world and from Satan. The great tribulation has its source as the wrath of God. That's a different thing altogether. We are promised not to experience the wrath of God. We may experience all kinds of correction. We may endure all kinds of persecution. Indeed, that's not the Great Tribulation. We'll come to that. And there's an attitude that somehow, especially here in America, that Christians are not going to have any problems. We could be facing very dark times. Where do we get the audacity, the arrogance, to assume that we're going to escape what most of the body of Christ and most of the world for most of the last 1,900 years had to endure? It's called persecution. And... Uh, now, the other side of the coin is the date setters. Boy, there's a long history of these. I won't take you through them all. But you can go through almost every segment of history. has had, uh, well, it's Joachim of Flores in the, in the 13th century, a uh, bunch of them all the way through, uh, even to uh, recent times, William Miller in 1843, and then again on October in, in 1844, and then uh, C.T. Russell in 1874. Most of us remember E.C. Uh, e. Wisenant's books, 88 Reasons for 1988. Those books are a collector's item, huh? Uh, Harold Camping in September of 1994, he had that nailed. And of course with the 2000, now we're in a new thousand, you know, a whole new cycle. There's a whole new cycle of people with charts and diagrams explaining jubilee years, whatever. And, and uh, let's take a quick look at the scripture. Of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but the Father only. In fact, the Mark reference of that same thing says, not the Son, but the Father only. Interesting passage. Matthew 24, 42. Watch therefore, for you know not what hour the Lord doth come. Matthew 24, 44. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. There again, it's not date said, but notice again the eminence that's there. Be ready. Because you don't know when he's going to, he, could, he can arrive at any moment. So don't set dates. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. I believe the reason this thing is not clear is because God is going to catch Satan by surprise. That's part of the strategy, I believe. 
personal conjecture. Be ye therefore ready also, for the Son of Man cometh at an hour when ye think not. Luke 12, 40. Acts 1, 7. He said unto them, It is not for you to know the times of the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. Now, the thing you discover as you get into this topic in depth, you start collecting the verses that seem to refer to what I'll call the second coming of Jesus Christ. For every, most of you realize that there's, when in his first coming there were over 300 prophecies that were specifically fulfilled in his first coming. What you may not realize is that for every one of those, there are eight prophecies of a second coming. There's over 2,500 specific details of a second coming. So as you go through your Bible study, you start collecting those, and as you start collecting those and examining them, you'll discover, you'll discover something rather strange. You'll discover that there's a cluster of them that have a lot in common. And I'm going to call those, for lack of a better term, the second coming. His return in power to set up his kingdom. Daniel 2, Daniel 7, Daniel 12, Zechariah, all through the New Testament, on it goes, Revelation, so on. And there's a whole list. I won't go through each one of these individually. They'll be in your notes for those who want to track them down. We're going to compare them another way. But there's, there's one group that have a certain set of characteristics in common, and a couple of dozen of those. There's another group that I'll call the rapture passages that are quite different. In fact, you discover they're contradictory. In one case, you don't know when he's coming. The other one, you're going to know exactly when he's coming. In one case, he comes in secret for his own. In the other one, every eye shall see him. You begin to realize, wait a minute. As you study these two clusters of a couple of dozen references in each bucket, you begin to realize this has to be talking about two different things. And indeed it does. The second coming of Christ in the broad sense is it comes in two phases. Once for the church, once for Israel. Once for the church to fulfill his promises to his bride. And secondly, he comes in power to fulfill all the commitments that God has laid down in both the Old and New Testaments for a kingdom on the earth where he'll take David's throne, etc. And uh, very, very interesting times. Two events. Let's contrast these a different way, by function rather than by reference. In one case, the rapture, there's a translation of all the believers. In the second coming, there's no translation involved. He comes into the earth and sets up his kingdom on the earth, and there's people that live in the earth. They have children. They have, you go in the millennium, there's going to be people that die. It's a different kind of, you know. It's different in some respects, and yet it's not, it's not eternity yet. That comes at the end of the thousand years. In the rapture, the translated saints go to heaven. In the second coming, translated saints return to the earth with him. Different deal. It's, a different, it's in a different lane of traffic, if I may. In the rapture, the earth isn't judged. He doesn't come to the earth. He gathers, meets us in the air. The judgment comes later, the second coming. The earth's judged. Here's perhaps the most important distinction between these two groups of prophecies. In the one case, they're imminent at any moment, and they're signless. There's no sign that needs to precede the rapture, other than the shout, the voice of the archangel, the trumpet of God. I and mean, that's like now. There isn't a precedent set of conditions you can see coming. For the second coming, there is the most documented period of time in the entire Bible. A seven-year history that has more information about it than any other period of time in the Bible. It precedes the second coming. If that starts, you can set, almost set the date. In fact, there's a mid-course correction. Make sure you're on track. They say the rapture is not in the Old Testament. I don't happen to believe that. I'll show you why. But that's the standard dictum. And, of course, second coming is all predicted throughout the Old Testament. Rapture is the believers only. Second coming affects all men on earth. The rapture occurs before the day of wrath is so promised. And the second coming concludes the day of wrath. So rapture has no reference to Satan. He's not a player. In fact, his whole thing, I think, is geared to get him by surprise. Second coming, Satan's bound. When the rapture occurs, that's like a starting gun for Satan because he knows he's got a little bit, of, only a little time. That's part of the game that's going on. The rapture, Jesus comes for his own. Second coming, he comes with his own. That's what the references say in many places. Rapture comes in the air. The, the second coming comes to the earth. Rapture, he claims his bride. The second coming, he comes with his bride. In the rapture, only his own will see him. You know, it's interesting. After his resurrection, he was only seen by loving eyes, and he was only touched by loving hands. You study the Chronicle very carefully. It's very interesting. Apparently, in the rapture, too, only his own will see him. Second coming, every eye will see him and tremble. Rapture... 
generally, the Great Tribulation begins. Now, I want to be cautious about this. That's the way it's usually presented. Not necessarily at that instant. But the rapture triggers a series of events that, caught, that leads to the Great Tribulation. The second coming of the millennium begins. The rapture is the church believers only. Many scholars point out that the Old Testament saints will not be resurrected until after the millennium. That comes as a shock to many, but you can check Daniel 12 to check that out for yourself. So we see the marriage fulfilled, the covenant's been established, 1 Corinthians 11, the purchase price has been paid, 1 Corinthians 6, brides have been set apart and all kinds of references. That's most of the New Testament is admonitions to the bride to keep herself apart, preserved. We're reminded of the covenant again in 1 Corinthians 11. The bridegroom left for the father's house, and we're waiting for 1 Thessalonians 4. So in the next session, we'll take a break, but the next session I'm going to say pattern is prologue. We're going to take a look at strategic structure in the scripture, and uh, partly for a strategic perspective and partly for some surprises that uh, uh, you may find rather provocative. So uh, let's take a brief period. But as we do, as we do, I want you to be thinking about the invitation that Jesus has given to the bride. I go to prepare a place for you. Is he preparing a place for you? Is Jesus busy right now, tonight, preparing a place for you? Are you certain of that? Because that's really what it's all about. And we'll talk more about that in the next session. Let's take a break. <laughs>